Hello and welcome back to the Stubborn Book Podcast. This is Bernadette. And we have come to the end. This is chapter six, the conclusion of the book, Stubborn by Andy Bob Cajun Junkin. And this is episode eight, the last in the eight part series. So our last episode of the book Stubborn, this one is, although the last, it's definitely not the least as they say. It is probably my favorite one actually. and that's probably because I feel that it hits a lot of nerves and provides a perspective that goes far beyond um, business partnerships or farm partnerships. So without further ado, here is the last episode, the last chapter of the book Stubborn. Chapter 6, Conclusion, Focus on What Matters. Entitlement refers to the belief that one is inherently deserving of certain privileges or advantages without necessarily having earned them. Entitlement kills family farms, business partnerships, and marriages. When you're born on a farm and every day go out to feed cows, it is difficult to imagine that barn empty. Just the same, it's impossible to imagine never speaking to your dad or never getting together with your uncle for Christmas. It's almost like trying to imagine a day the sun doesn't rise. When you come from a successful family-owned business, and have a successful family dynamic everyone in the community envies. It's something we all take for granted. Entitlement blinds us until it's too late. Nobody gets married or goes into a partnership with a jerk, but everyone gets divorced from one. We don't know how many people are actually happy in their marriages or business partnerships, but I do know that it's a lot less than what is portrayed on Facebook and Instagram. Through raw statistics, we know that nearly half of our society's marriages end up in divorce. This is not due to bliss, but frustration. It is hard to guess as to how many sons or daughters leave a family business out of frustration because most of the time the family spins a positive face about a son or daughter getting an exciting opportunity outside of the business when the truth is they are leaving the business due to frustrations. I'll let you judge this for yourself, but I know that within my agriculture college class reunion, almost everyone was keen to go home to join the family business and at our 25-year class reunion, only a handful remained involved in the business. I'd say it's a very similar to divorce statistics, but instead of leaving a spouse, they are leaving the family business, which is equally as painful. Nobody would tell a statistician doing a door-to-door -door survey the honest truth about how good either their marriage or business partnership is really going. Nobody has an accurate statistic of how many married couples and how many family business owners are truly happy behind closed doors. Certainly, you might see a family business win a prestigious industry award and be all smiles on the front page of a magazine, but are they really happy behind closed doors, or do they have more bad days than good days and are miserable? Do they think of divorce often? The one statistic that I know is that 12% of family farms pass over from grandma to grandchildren. I am only guessing, but I believe that less than 12% of marriages and business partnerships are truly happy on the majority of days. It's not a majority. It's a slim minority. To be successful, you have to realize that you aren't entitled. And think like an underdog. We have a skyrocketing mental health crisis in most family businesses right now, and a big underlying factor that is causing this crisis is the lack of solid marriages or close family relationships caused by stressful business partnerships. Obviously, a divorce or failed partnership is going to lead to financial ruin. On almost every metric that you can think of, this issue has a deep and very negative impact on the success and happiness of everyone's lives. There is no win-win. It's all a loss. Hubris is when someone has excessive pride or arrogance, thinking they are better or more important than they really are. It often leads them to make poor decisions because they underestimate the consequences of their actions. In simple terms, it's like having a big ego that blinds you to your own flaws and limits. We get into partnerships with either spouses or family thinking that it's going to be happily ever after, only to be disappointed a decade later that it's not working out the way it should be. As I said earlier, entitlement kills both marriages and business partnerships. There are many reasons given for a divorce, but I believe the root issues come down to the four H's that we laid down throughout this book. Head, we butt heads, becoming obsessed with winning an argument at all costs. Heart, we stop caring about the needs of others only prioritizing our own selfish needs. Hands. We point fingers at each other and never reflect on our own role in the problem. Health. We make decisions based on instant gratification, not thinking about the long-term consequences of decisions for the long-term success of the business or family relationships. We refuse to accept that someday we'll die and not care about others' needs beyond that point. 
These are instances where we are the wrong type of stubborn. This is what causes both marriages and family businesses to fail. Issues like adultery, causing the breakup of a marriage or a partner not being trustworthy are side effects of these root evils. If your family isn't hyper-focused on the few factors that lead to success, there are many, many distractions that will lead to failure. To achieve success and happiness, you need to become the right type of stubborn. I got into a car accident and had a piece of glass in my eye. I went to the emergency room and the doctor put my head into what was essentially a vice grip and started poking into my eye with a pair of tweezers. The young doctor made the comment that he had only done such an action once when he was an intern and the way he was poking around my eyeball. I realized that Larry the cable guy would have been equally qualified. It took everything I had to not punch him. Yet if I didn't have the self-discipline to let the doctor help me take the glass out, I would probably be blind today. In that moment, I had to choose to be the right type of stubborn. In the same way, in this moment, you must choose to be the right type of stubborn, which can mean this. Head, you need to stop butting heads with each other and learn to make decisions together as a team. It doesn't matter who is right. What matters is the right decision gets made. Heart, you need to stop being narcissistic and care for the needs of others, not just yourself. Hands, you need to stop pointing fingers and look at the three fingers pointing back at you. Instead of controlling others, you need to change your own behavior and self-improve first. Health. You need to start making all decisions with a long-term perspective. This might mean getting comfortable with the concept that you aren't going to live forever and that life goes on without you. You need to prioritize others' well-being, not just your own. The principles of this book have been about how to change these four root problems to shift the trajectory of both your business partnership and marriage. Although they are common sense, they aren't things we think about often, yet they impact several of the things we care about most. The only way that you'll actually make changes in your life is when you stop taking success for granted and adopt an underdog mentality. You need to approach your relationships with a sense of humility, not entitlement. We need to focus on what matters. We need to be stubborn in all the right things. With a sense of humility. The problem with our society is that we enter into relationships, business or personal, with a sense of entitlement and pride instead of humility. We get focused on distractions of the moment instead of focusing on what matters. Think about the pomp and circumstance that goes into a wedding. We get more obsessed about having a memorable reception over a few hours to impress our friends and get great photos. But within a few days, we forget to remember the true meaning of what the ceremony meant. One of my hobbies was officiating weddings. I've married 42 of my friends. I had a lot of friends in college, and there was a period when I was getting invited to at least 12 weddings a year. I didn't get married until I was 42. In my 20s, I thought I would have a big show for a wedding and have a couple hundred guests. My friends got into a competition with each other over who could have the biggest wedding, and the last guy spent over $100,000 on a wedding which was over the top. When I got married to Bernadette at 42, I didn't invite 95% of the friends I should have. We only had 20 guests each, and our budget was only $2,000 for the whole shindig. I knew I didn't want our wedding to be a competition, but a real example of what we both wanted our relationship to be like until death do us part. As part of the ceremony, I insisted on having a particular Anabaptist tradition I believed to be invaluable. The priest thought it was a bit odd for a Roman Catholic wedding ceremony, but I insisted on washing each other's feet as Jesus once did. Although I think of Bernadette as darn close to perfect as you can get, I am far from a perfect husband and am definitely a flawed individual. I couldn't tell you what color our flowers were at the wedding, but I always remember washing her feet and the importance of being humble. This has really changed the outcome of our relationship, and it's only the times we faltered in our relationship that we forgot to remember this. I've done a lot of foolish things in my life, but one of the wisest things I did was get married with a sense of humility. We don't have the perfect marriage, but I can tell you it has exceeded everyone's expectations, including mine, and having a good marriage is the one thing I'm most grateful for. I believe that for any relationship to be successful, it's being humble and subservient not overly proud that makes the relationship work, and for you to have a partnership you can be truly proud of. The advice I've given you in this book isn't just words, but what I truly believe. When you get married, your priorities shift because now you have a partner to consider in almost every decision you make. Instead of just thinking about yourself, you also have to think about your spouse and their needs. You might find yourself making compromises and working together to plan for the future. 
Your focus may move towards building a strong and loving relationship, sharing responsibilities, and supporting each other emotionally and financially. It's about creating a life together where you both feel happy, secure, and connected. And that often means adjusting your individual priorities to align with your shared goals and dreams. For most business partnerships, there is no wedding ceremony. But a business partnership is like a marriage just the same because you are committing yourself to a long-term relationship and the quality of that partnership will impact the happiness and success of your life. Like a marriage, in order for the relationship to be successful, your priorities need to shift to look out for the good of everyone, not just yourself. You will need to make sacrifices and make tough decisions to do hard things in the moment to have a happier life together. You must set aside your pride and egos in order to create family relationships and a family business you can truly be proud of. This requires you to always be focused on what matters. Keep family first. Get hyper-focused. Consider Elon Musk and what energizes him, colonializing Mars prior to his death. He might portray an image in the media that he is erratic, but he has become successful because he has been hyper-focused on doing a few things right. He's obsessed with the use of his time, and it would be a challenge for anyone to help him be more efficient with the use of his time. I don't think this is a function of his obsession with time management, but more importantly, his obsession with what ultimately matters to him. He is choosing to be stubborn for what matters to him and won't let anything distract him, even for five minutes. Every opportunity that comes his way he evaluates whether that is going to get him closer to his mission of setting foot on Mars or not. If it isn't, he doesn't have time for it. He is very stubborn at expending all his limited energy on the things that matter most to him. Whether you agree or disagree with his motives and choices, you've got to admire his focus. The first piece of land I recommend every farmer should buy is their gravesite, not the farm next door or a big house in town, but the soil where eventually he or she is going to become soil. But not just his or her gravesite, but enough plots for their entire family in that little country cemetery a few miles away from the family farm. Like Elon Musk, I want that son or daughter to get hyper-focused on what they want to accomplish in their lifetime. I want the whole family to get hyper-focused. You are all probably going to the same graveyard someday. What do you want to do with your limited time together on Earth? When you make decisions not based on where you are standing, but where you are eventually going and the legacy you want for your life, it changes everything. A big part of that is what you do with your family and your career. What is the vision of the business that you want and what legacy do you want to leave for future generations? What do you want your marriage to be like? Do you just want a gravestone to show for your life's work? Or do you want your great grandchildren to have the same opportunity for the same type of childhood your grandpa gave you? Do you want to get the instant gratification of taking your anger out on a family member in the moment or be stubborn at being your best self and be a person they mourn after your death? How do you create not only a family empire, but groom successors so that your legacy is going and growing 50 years past your funeral? How do you live a life that truly matters? If you don't divorce, you are likely to be buried 10 feet from your spouse and close family members that you are in a business partnership with. The questions you should ask yourself are, how can you enjoy being in similar proximity to each other when you are alive, not just dead? How do you create the family culture and be the partner and friend anyone would want to be with? What would you give your life for? That should be what you dedicate your life to do. To accomplish this, we can't just assume that we will be buried beside our spouse or that our family will attend our funeral. We can't take these relationships for granted and let entitlement take hold, but instead approach them with humility and prioritize them. We need to be the right type of stubborn 24-7. There are a lot of fathers who claim they'd sacrifice their lives for their children, yet day to day they don't make any such sacrifices. They act in a narcissistic manner, putting their needs first. This is why divorce courts are so full. Many men only fight for the privilege of being with their kids after their kids are gone. If the men who spent $50,000 on divorce lawyers had placed similar effort on spending time being good fathers to their kids prior to their spouse leaving them, would they be in divorce court at all? Divorce courts are full because spouses chose the easy thing in the moment that will bring instant gratification, not the hard thing that will bring ultimate happiness. They weren't the right type of stubborn. 
Nearly 95% of farm bankruptcy auctions aren't caused by a drought or low commodity prices. Just like 95% of divorce cases aren't caused by adultery or irreconciled differences. Those might be the factors that are the nail in the coffin, but the root issues are the decade prior to that moment when you took things for granted, where you invested your time and money foolishly on things that don't matter. When you didn't focus on what matters and daily you weren't realizing your fullest potential. When you chose instant gratification instead of making sacrifices to be stubborn at doing the right thing. What type of stubborn do you choose to be? This is what separates the wheat from the chaff. Reactive versus proactive. Recently, I spoke to a larger family farm where they cash crop 14,000 acres. The grandsons heard me speak at their college and wanted to bring me in to evolve how they work together. But the 82-year-old patriarch was abrasive to any suggestions, or that his family even had problems. I told him that he had gone from farming 300 acres to 14,000 acres in his lifetime because he was proactive in how he approached problems. Several of his neighbors failed at farming because they would have foreseeable breakdowns mid-spring and then unable to plant their crop on time. They reacted to problems instead of anticipating and proactively correcting problems like he did. This patriarch went over his equipment with a fine-tooth comb over the winter and identified any potential problems before the spring, upgrading any equipment that could break down well before it did. He identified potential problems and tried to fix them before they became a real problem. The principles outlined in this book is in line with the same common sense philosophy. Anything you can do to eliminate potential frustrations is going to make working with family better in times that are easy and more importantly in times that are stressful. Proactively fixing problems instead of sticking your head in the sand is just plain common sense. Throughout this book, I spoke to you about a few dark client cases that might seem extreme, but in these cases they are still farming today and are happy because they chose to be the right type of stubborn. Nearly 14 months after Sadie had that tragic day when she slit her wrists, she had a baby which she named Norman after her father-in-law. It's now awesome to see that boy running around the farm working and playing with his grandpa. Every time I think about those two, it gives me purpose to my job. However, there have been other farmers who have chosen to make excuses to not be the right type of stubborn, and this has led to some very tragic endings I hope you never experience. For instance, just this spring, a farmer called me up to spend hours complaining about the fact that his sons didn't communicate or get enough work done around the farm, yet he refused to develop the habit of doing a 10-minute phone call with his partners at the end of each day. Because he refused to change, yet expected everyone else to do so, his son quit and he hasn't spoken to his grandchildren since. The patriarch's life has changed, but not for the better because he was the wrong type of stubborn. I can lead a horse to water, but I can't make it drink. After reading this book, there will be some who agree with the principles, but never have the grit to apply them, and tragically, they won't be getting together for Christmas with family someday. You have to decide for yourself what type of person you are going to be, a victim or a success story. It's really that simple. I can't make that decision for you. You have to decide and do this for yourself. To say you are going to make one simple change to who you are this month is easy to say, but it is hard to actually do. It takes discipline. To do this doesn't just take you saying something, but meaning it. To do this, you have to shift your identity and to look at anything that gets in the way of who you want to become with the same self-defense as someone coming to cut your heart out of your chest. Do you choose to be the worst version of yourself, choose instant gratification, and choose to be the wrong kind of stubborn in how you deal with your spouse and your family business partners? Or are you stubborn with yourself to do the right thing, especially when it is hard? When there is an excuse to do something easier, but you choose to be stubborn because you know in the long term it's the right thing to do. When it's easy to be negative and reactionary, but you chose to be your better self in that moment, are you stubborn with your family or are you stubborn with yourself to be the best person you can be? Final words. I'm the seventh generation farm boy from a little town called Bob Cajun, Ontario, Canada. Love is not a strong enough word for how much I feel about where I am from. It's the prettiest little nook in the world, and it's part of me. Everyone since college has called me Bob Cajun because I told everyone about my proud family's history of how my ancestors cleared our farm back in 1832 and how I was going to continue that family legacy. I grew up being told that my ancestor had died so that I could have the right to farm, 
I found out the hard way that nobody has the right to farm or continue a family business. It's a rare privilege. You might have a proud family history, but humility is what is required to have a farm and a family to be proud of. With 70% of family farms, there is a successor who is interested in taking over the family legacy, and there is a similar statistic for most family-owned businesses in most industries. Yet only 12% are successful in passing over grandma's farm to their grandchildren, and I hate to admit to you that because of our narcissism, entitlement, and stubbornness, my family became a statistic. I left Bob Cajun and officially took the middle name Bob Cajun. As a way to stay committed to my life mission that I learned on that barn beam, I left Ontario with the goal to help as many farm families worldwide as possible. I won't let myself have the privilege of going back to Bob Cajun until my boys spread my ashes and I become part of the soil. I now live in a log cabin on a little homestead in eastern Iowa. I have three boys. The oldest is only five. Huckleberry, Samuel Colt, and Scout with another boy coming this Thanksgiving. My best friend, Hillbilly, died two years ago from Lou Gehrig's disease, and he left behind two boys who were just 13 and 12 at the time. On his deathbed, I offered to help him engrave a few precious words onto a jackknife and inside of an engraved wallet that would steer his boys on the right path as they walked through life. Picking the right words was tough to do. What words can you say to a boy that will change the trajectory of his life? Hillbilly taught me not just to be grateful to be alive each day, but to be stubborn on myself to set the right example and instill good values into my boys with whatever time I have left. Every day I carry a jackknife engraved with, Be the man you want your boys to become. This mantra has changed my behavior, ranging from consistently getting out of bed at 4 a.m. to how I speak to their mother. Hillbilly's death caused me to realize that I could be gone at any moment. Over the last two years, I've wrestled with what words of wisdom that I can leave behind for my boys, and this is what led me to write this book. I have bought each one of my boys a matching belt buckle for when they get older, and I'm not here to tell them the words I hope will change the trajectory of their lives. On the back it says, easy decisions, hard life, hard decisions, easy life. Be the right type of stubborn. My only hope for my sons is that they learn to be the right type of stubborn. And that is the hope I have for you, starting this moment 